Hey gouache geeks and inklings, Hajra here. Please visit my website dashboard for all my online platform links on one page to support my art creation and instruction. Today I'll be doing a Lawson Wood Master Study in Ink Tents, perfect for Inktober and Halloween vibes, and this is also a collab with a new YouTuber, the awesome David Gordon, so be sure to check his video out and also his channel and Instagram. I'll provide links below and at the end of the video. Thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic art adventures begin. Okay, so I started in with just the yellow on his sort of breast area, and it's going to be a wet on dry. You can make it wet on wet, but there's really no reason to because I'm going to be doing this very opaquely, so nice and thick in a, a heavy cream consistency with the ink tents here right out of the pan set. So I'm going to not really care about doing the wet on wet unless it's coming into a layer of paint on top because I really want the base layers to be quite thick. And don't make it so thick that your paint doesn't move. You can see that my paint is still moving, and in some areas it's getting to a medium consistency. It's better to make it a little bit thinner than so thick that it's like tar on the paper and won't move. So just keep that in mind that it's more like a heavy cream consistency, but if it doesn't flow on the paper, then you need to add some water to your paint if you're painting even with gouache or ink tents in a gouache style. And while the yellow was still wet, I go ahead and throw on some orange into that breast area for some temperature variegation. A good idea for shadow colors on anything is to go in an analogous direction instead of just going right to a complement or to black. Of course, the complement is still going to be a better idea, so had I used purple better than just a dead black, the analogous color scheme makes it even more vibrant, so that's going towards yellow and orange and red orange, and that's what I'm doing here. Because it's a feathery bird, the wet on wet makes for a nice bloomy effect, and I'm going to continue to just floof that out a bit with the tip of my brush if it doesn't move the way that I want it to. I just want to make sure there's soft, cottony edges all around. And so I have my second brush, as always, that's just damp with no paint in it to sort of fluff out hard edges that I want to dry a little bit softer. Getting to the eye part, and it's going to be green. If you go and look up Google uh, Keel Bill Toucan, and you'll see all these colors are really mostly accurate to what I'm using here. The only thing I didn't follow was that I made the red part of his body a bigger red patch than it is in a Keel Bill Toucan. So that's the only part where this Toucan isn't accurate to a Keel Bill Toucan. It really just does have this many colors, including this ring around the eye that's green. So I just thought it would be a good idea to turn that into a monocle and make it look like he's this, you know, hoity-toity posh Toucan playing in an orchestra. And this green isn't going to be dark enough. I'm actually going to come back and make it a little bit darker, but it is a nice vibrant lime green. Outside of the little monocle ring area, I'm going to again use that floofy motion with my brush to sort of just stipple in the color and then fluff it out so that it looks softer to get that fluffy feather effect. And this is kind of what Lawson Wood was doing visually. You can see it is that he was applying the feathers so they were loosely implied in this fluffy way. He wasn't painting individual feathers, but it actually looks as realistic, if not more, and definitely more painterly than if you had just applied the paint in such a way as to make every single feather evident there. I really wanted to capture his vibrancy and humorous undertones in this study, and I actually made it even more vibrant by changing the toucan that he did into a keelbill toucan instead, with that wacky multicolored beak with a zigzag edge. Sort of like this toucan is wearing a dress-up peak for Halloween along with playing in an orchestra. I also morphed the dark circle around his eye into a monocle on a little chain as it just really called out to me as a further costume addition. I do like the colors, but I think that the original beak had sort of a better cohesion with the rest of what's going on here, like, you know, the violin and the violin string, and so you have enough props here that can make the piece confusing without making the beak multicolored as well, but it was a fun thing for me to throw in. I'm using a finer brush for the eyeball, darken up the little eyelash line and show a little bit of the eyeball and the sides of the eye and everything to make him look like he's sort of halfway looking down and kind of seriously playing the violin in a really into his music kind of way. I did make the eyelid green and orange and I actually, looking back on it as I'm voicing over, like it better than what I ended up doing, which is like plopping in the white to bring that eyeball out. And at the time I was thinking that I wanted more contrast and what I was seeing was that it looked like it wasn't giving me enough contrast, so I ended up adding white to that eyelid, but I actually like that green and orange now that I'm looking at it, and I kind of wish I'd left it that way. I can always go and change it back, though, obviously. A little bit more color, darker green color to the monocle ring area, and I'm actually going to come back later and make it even darker because it's just going to dry back too light for me, and I want it to look like a real monocle around his eye. This is that same gel pen that I've been trying to use up, I think, at this point for like two years. And maybe it's because I do small paintings, but this gel pen just won't run out. So either this is like the most amazing gel pen in the world by Jelly Roll, or 
it's just, you know, a curse that it's not going away. <laughs> I'm trying to use it up so I can get to using like, you know, the white paint that I actually have, but good for dotting in dots and stuff. And it's definitely good for travel, but I prefer the texture of the paint in gouache tubes, pans, or jars much more. So once it's run out, I'm not going to get the, the jelly roll pen again. And I'm doing these like little beads that are on the chain that are attaching this sort of monocle to his breast area. And I'm doing them similar to how I did the beads in the necklace on the Walter Crane study. So if you know which study I'm talking about, it's on Skillshare. You can check that out if you want to see that more close up for a bigger piece. Not to say that I'd recommend Skillshare to anybody, and you might know why, but anyway, moving on from that. The bill was probably the most difficult part of this because Lawson Wood's original was in one color, more or less, with a little bit of a reflected rim lighting of magenta coming in from the red breast and but it was mostly that yellowish orange color and I ended up making it way more complicated by turning it into a keel bill toucan beak with all those different colors in it. I think it made it so that with the violin bow and also with the string and everything there that I think there might have been a little bit too much busyness going on but I did enjoy the colorful bill and being able to put a few more colors into the study so it's totally up to you if you do this study if you want to do it like his bill with less color or like a keel bill toucan like I did here with all the different colors. I basically drew in the sketch in a lot of detail like I tend to do freehand. And I don't have to lighten the pencil up so much because I know I'm going to be doing this paint rather thick, wet on dry, and it's going to cover up most of the pencil. But do try to lift up some of the extra pencil with a kneaded eraser because that way it doesn't really muddy your color. You can see that for the string that he's holding in his beak, I've got a little bit too much pencil and you can kind of see that it's smearing a little bit into the yellow. And once you've got some paint down on there, it's kind of hard to lift out. And so I tend to try to avoid that, but miss that this time. So you can see that pencil is a little bit too dark there. And this is definitely wet on dry so far for the beak. It's really nice to get the wet and wet effects when you can, like I did for the feathers on the body. But for this bill, I'm going more for wet on dry. And then when I want a blended soft edge, I'm using the damp brush to give me a gradient edge. And if you want to know how I do those, and I actually have a video that shows how I do all my different types of blending and edges in real time. Anyway, I've been AWOL for a few weeks, and I'm sorry about that to my patrons especially. And that's basically because PG&E cut electric for two days and nights where I live in California, and this happened to a lot of people and it was really inconvenient. And so that meant that there was no hot water, no lights, no heating, no internet, no electronic devices after all the batteries conked out. So I fell behind on work for YouTube and Patreon, as well as my exhibition uh, work that I was already behind on. And it got really cold in our cottage. And not only did I catch cold and get sick for a week after the power came back, but all my hypermobility injuries just tightened up. And so I basically pulled my shoulder and back. And that kept me away from my work even longer. And added to that, some totally horrible person hit our brand new truck with his motorcycle on the highway after punching the side of it, and he broke the left side mirror off completely and then drove off in a hit and run, and that was $500 we had to pay out of pocket. So it's been a long few weeks. But I'm going to take a moment to again say that this is a collab video. I was supposed to do this collab vid with the awesome David Gordon two weeks back, but I had to ask him for a rain check twice due to being thrown back to pioneer times and all the health side effects of that because of the power being out. But he was super sweet and okay with that. So thanks so much, David, for being such a mellow dude who's got my back, which I so appreciate during the hassle of the past few weeks. David is new on YouTube. He's also a supporter of the new Raza Portable Easel, and he asked to do a collab with me a little while ago, and I was totally down with that as I really love his original graphic novel work and style and diverse characters. So go watch his collab vid with me. Check out his channel and subscribe on YouTube and also follow him on Instagram. He has some really awesome graphic novel characters and it's perfect to introduce yourself to an artist like him during Inktober because he does a lot of ink work. By the time I'd gotten in the orange part of the beak and the yellow and the green together, it started to become obvious to me that maybe this beak was going to be a little bit too busy. I did end up still enjoying the final look of the piece and that's fine. Start to second guess that maybe it would have been a better idea to not have a Keelbill toucan in this case because he's already doing so many other things with that violin situation. But definitely the colors and the Inktense pan set, this is the first pan set they released. That set actually has these juicy tropical colors like that lime green, yellow, and also that bright mango orange. 
And the red is nice and vibrant too. The only color that isn't vibrant is they don't have like a magenta or like a bright purple. They sort of have an eggplant purple, which is very pretty in itself, but it's a rather dull purple. So if you want a magenta, you can't really make it using this set. So I did my best by when I threw in a little bit of that purple and I could have pulled out more colors, but this is a set I was using and also wanted to stay with a limited color scheme. So you can see that the shadows on the bill here are gonna end up being a little bit purple, but the purple tends to go almost right away towards brown because it's not a very clean purple. So instead of looking magenta, it's gonna look like red with more brownish purple shadows instead of magenta purple shadows. And again, that has to do with the cleanliness, the chroma, the saturation of the colors that you're choosing. In this case, that was a low chroma, low saturation purple. So that's gonna make a nice dull shadow color, which is great and earthy, but if you want magenta, then you're not gonna be able to get it with this color. I went under the actual zigzag jagged edge shape of that bill with a little bit of shadow color and I'm going to come back later with a little bit of lighter color too just to give it that little bit of distance from the lower part of that beak so that it doesn't look like they're both sitting on the same plane exactly. And I did see that there was a little bit of blue in a Keelbill Toucan's beak, little tiny accents of it. It looked closer to the right blue on the Toucan when it's on the white paper, but when it mixes with the green because it's sort of like a dusty blue, it sort of goes right into a gray blue territory. So in order to prevent that, maybe put down a coat of white first and waterproof um, ink tents and then come back over it with that blue to keep it cleaner. As the camera pops on and off, you can see that I've done the background in blue and that was just three coats of that same blue all over the background. And I just made sure that it was even that way because the first coat, some places were darker and some places were lighter. And then in the second coat, it became mostly even. And in the third coat, I basically just touched up a few areas so I thought they were going to look like they were going to be a little bit more blotchy. But it dries pretty much even like you've printed it off of a printer. So if you wanted to do a really even coat of a color, then the ink tents and also the Phil Martin Bombay inks are really good for like doing that comic book type old fashioned coloring where you just have a color fill for like a cartoon or a comic book look, you can totally do that. You just have to do it wet on dry and follow the wet bead of the paint along the entire page and you'll get a very even coat. Now you can see me in a few places making mistakes and dragging my paint, the black into the blue area or the black into other areas. And that's because um, I have got like this lefty curse of being left-handed and I always drag my paint across. And I used to wear like inking gloves or half mittens to prevent that, but just kept getting that annoying question of why are you wearing those gloves? And so I stopped wearing them, but that is the risk of not wearing them, is that you do end up getting ink in other parts of your painting sometimes. Picking up some of the stains that I've sort of tracked in other places, the black sort of pick up and remove off of this pretty easily. I do have a ruler now on top of the painting, and I use the ruler kind of as a drawing bridge or like a mall stick, but a drawing bridge is something that sits on the surface of the paper versus having to be angled over like a mall stick where you do for oil painting. So I actually turn this ruler into... A drawing bridge myself by giving it some dimension because I'm using this very thickly. There's actually some of it that's still a little bit water soluble, so it's not really drying waterproof. Again, if you want it to be totally waterproof, you're gonna have to make sure all of it's fully saturated. And I'm not really doing that as well when I'm doing this with the gouache because I'm going for a different technique, so I'm okay with that. But if you do want that, make sure your colors are fully saturated in order for it to be waterproof. The benefit of it not being fully waterproof is like a stain like that black will lift off pretty easily. So we decided to do Inktober and Halloweeny pieces for our collab and I settled on this Lawson Wood Master Studies. I just posted about wood on Patreon and this toucan playing a violin gave me a very holiday costume vibe. Like he's a regular bird during the daytime, but at nighttime he sort of moonlights, especially on Halloween, to play in an orchestra. At least that's my like, you know, random story that I made up to go with uh, this painting when I saw it. In past years, I've painted Sarah and Jareth from Labyrinth and Shahrazad from The Thousand One Nights, Simmerine and King Kozul from Dealing with Dragons, and Jack and Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas, and also Dory the Witch and Gink, among others. So you know I love painting fictional characters that remind me of Halloween during October. All those are in past videos, and you can check those out in my Holidays YouTube playlist as well. And that ruler is going to come back in a little bit because I'm going to actually use it to do straight lines on here. And I've gotten pretty good at doing straight lines and curved lines and all that freehand with a paintbrush just because sometimes I have to and a ruler doesn't work for that or something else doesn't work for that. So you just sort of practice and it gets better. If you want to get there without the practice or if you want to just have the security of having a ruler, if you angle a ruler against your page, 
or make your ruler higher up from the paper, you can rest the ferrule, the metal part of your brush, on the side of the ruler and then use that and drag that along the actual ruler edge and that'll give you a straight line the same way you would with a pencil. But you're going to be resting the metal part of the brush there, not the actual hair part of the brush. Otherwise, you're not going to get a straight line and plus you're going to get paint all over your ruler. I started out by testing it out on a paper just to show you that it's working with that paint. And then I went ahead and did that on the paper with the colors I wanted for the bow and stuff. And I'm going to actually have to touch this up because some of the lines aren't thick enough or they're not the right color. And I'm going to do all that touching up freehand. Really, it's easy if you have the ruler. And then, of course, practicing freehand will help them do the highlights freehand. Where the lines are getting thicker or thinner, in this case, the bow that he's holding is thicker on one side and thinner on the other side. So when I made that line thicker on one side, it was deliberate. And I don't have to actually lift and correct that because I'm basically going for a thicker line on the left side. And did the same thing for the string, except for I did it with some yellow ochre mixed with the white to make that color. And I don't think it's standing out as much on this beak because it's a multicolored beak. So I'm going to come back in and darken and lighten the different colors of the straight lines freehand as needed to make them have a little bit more contrast pop. I did want to put in the straight lines first before I got to doing the rest of the black. I wanted to make sure I got those straight lines in and didn't accidentally paint over that part of it or lose the pencil line. So that's why I put those in first. Now I'm putting the black in wet on dry. And I'm also going to be doing that mostly in a solid color, but I leave a little bit of that model texture there so it implies a little bit of that fuzzy feather look that this bird has. It doesn't have to be as smooth as the sky in the background because, you know, he's got feathers. More on Lawson Wood. He worked often and masterfully in the medium of gouache, which is why I chose to do a study of one of his birds in a gouache style with ink tents. He was an English illustrator, designer, and painter. His full name was Clarence Lawson Wood. But Lawson Wood was how he was known via his stylish nom de plume. Wood was born in 1878, a time of great change and eventually chaos. He was eventually enlisted in the Great War. He proved his mettle there, resulting in decoration by the French for his gallantry at Vimy Ridge during World War I. Wood was known for his humorous depictions of animals, particularly his memorable monkeys, parrots, and dinosaurs, as well as cavemen and policemen. He was avidly for animal welfare, and he was awarded membership in the Royal Zoological Society in 1934. His animal designs were reproduced as wooden toys, and he established a sanctuary for aged creatures. I also love gouache and animals, so he really must have been a kindred spirit. He was also an old-fashioned introvert like me as well, and this sort of showed up as he was rather reclusive in his later years, and died in Devon in 1957. If you look at his parrot and bird images, which are some of his most sort of standout pieces, you can see the rich, opaque use of gouache that he has, as well as his masterful facial expressions and body language that convey all that humor. I sense a part of what made him so successful at mirth was his capacity to insert convincing elasticity in the faces and poses of the animals having them stretch just enough to offer a wider spectrum of emotion without veering into distorted caricatures of the birds. In fact, it's impressive how realistic he kept his birds while still morphing them with human expressions. It definitely helped that he prudently utilized naturally expressive-looking birds, naturally smiley, goofy, or smart-looking birds, including toucans, roosters, and parrots. And I'm also going to throw in a little bit of shadow color to liven up that black a bit, and you can do that with any color you have that's in the painting that you feel like might be reflecting into that area. So I'm going to use a little bit of that purple that I used in the shadow for the beak, which is a natural way to sort of give your black some warmth. And I'm also going to use a little bit of the lime green on the wing areas to give that black on the wing a little bit of a greenish pop to it. And it's going to still be black, but it's going to be black with a temperature shift either toward green or toward purple or what have you, you know, whatever you choose to put in there. Again, that just makes it more interesting than doing a solid straight black. And you can definitely do a solid straight black, and it's not going to kill your piece. It's going to have a nice inky, nice graphic look to it. But for a piece like this, where you're actually working off the textures and working with value shifts and temperature shifts and all that jazz, you're really going to want to have a little bit of variety in your black as well, just for some fun. And again, I'm putting this ink tents on opaquely. And one of the virtues of that is though it's not going to be as waterproof as it would be if I had done it glaze upon glaze, not only does it get the work done faster and look nice as a gouache, I think it looks nicer than it does look when it's transparent, but it also leaves it just a little bit liftable. So if I want to correct it or blend the edges off a little bit, sometimes it works. So most of it will be drying waterproof, but a little bit of it will shift. So you can use that just to smear and fudge the edges around a bit now and again. 
and I am starting with the purple there underneath the black first. And that's what that purple looks like on its own. So you can see it's a lovely shadow. It's a very spooky, low intensity purple. So it worked great for a lot of ambiance in a nighttime scene, but like I was saying before, it's not gonna be the cleanest purple. And then you have that lime green and I'm putting the black over that. So I can still see a little bit of that greenish coming out through there. I am going to make sure I don't make the black so opaque in those areas because if I did, then it would just totally obliterate that green. If you're adding a color to your black in order for it to show, you have to make sure that there's enough in there for it to show up. Otherwise, of course, your black is just going to swallow it up. And black is one of the colors in this brand that I don't feel like is as dark or as vibrant as it can get. But that tends to happen with gouache too. So if you were using gouache, the gouache black can sometimes be a little bit more matte looking than a more luminous ink black or a watercolor black it tends to have just a teeny bit more sort of luminous depth and darkness to it versus a more matte black, which because it has no reflection at all, doesn't seem as dark, even though it's using a lot of the same pigments, obviously. So when I get to that bib area, I was considering dividing that bib up, but I decided because the beak was already so noisy, I changed my mind and I thought I'd just make the whole area red, even though it makes them look like a different kind of toucan. So that's, this is the one place where there's more red here and it's not going from red to black as quickly. There's gonna be more red here and then just the black tail. It's not perfectly accurate Keel Bill toucan, just so you know. And so I'm gonna go ahead and smudge that paint into those areas to make those meeting points a little less harsh. And of course, into that red while it's still wet, I can add in that purple for some shadow color and it goes into this nice maroon brownish shadow color on the red like it did at the end of the beak there. So that's what that purple looks like in that red, which is what I was saying because it's not a very clean purple, it goes to a brown, but it looks fine for this painting. See how I'm just sort of doing those shorter straight lines and they work perfectly fine. Put your hand against the paper and go in a repetitive back and forth horizontal stroke and just angle it so that it's comfortable for you. But you can do a straight line that way when you're inking something. And if you wanna do a thinner line, then you can actually go really fast with a thinner pigment in your brush and then that will streak across the paper. So you can go fast or slow depending on the density of your paint. In this case, because the paint is thicker, I'm sort of edging along the paper instead of going in one fast streak like I would if I was using like a black ink or something. This is a little bit thicker than a liquid ink. And just gonna polish off the rest of that beak. There was a lime green area that I needed to spruce up and also some of the shadows I needed to spruce up. So this Lawson Wood study is only a few of the master studies left that I had scheduled for this year, and next year I plan on going back to mostly originals. As I mentioned very early this year, I know folks enjoy my master studies and all the art history information that I provide, but I really need to refocus on mostly personal projects. I just don't have enough time or hand health power to keep up doing 50% master studies and 50% originals like I have over the past few years. And I'm going to discuss that more in a future video coming soon. For now, just suffice it to say that I feel more rewarded doing more originals at this point in my life. And I'm super excited about getting to my long list of neglected original artwork ideas, some of them going back five years. So I think I've waited long enough to really give all my time and attention to that so colorful it sort of also needed a darker edge before it hit the sky and you might want to do this in a different way with a soft edge for another piece but because this piece has sort of a graphic bold look to it it's okay to put that hard edge in there and not worry too much about having too much of a decal effect and for that string that's in his mouth i really was concerned that because the beak was so multicolored that it wasn't showing up so i tried to give it a darker form shadow line that was on the actual string and also a little bit of a cast shadow that's underneath the string from the beak the cast shadow part of it is also happening in the reference, but the form shadow that's on the string is not happening in the reference. And I just added that because you literally can't see that string in this overly colorful beak. And then you have those little toothy looking shapes that are not teeth, obviously, because birds don't have teeth, but they're like this toothy pattern on the beak. And I'm going to throw that in too on top of these colors. It's pretty much dried waterproof, the paint underneath it. I worked rather thick and didn't care about saturating all of it. Most of it is waterproof, so a little bit of it will shift, but not really too much of it because even when I'm putting it on this thick, I do try to go back and forth in a brushing motion and it does saturate most of that ink tents, which means that it'll then therefore dry mostly waterproof. Most of this has been wet on dry, with a little bit of damp gradient edges and also some wet and wet when it came to the floofy, bloomy feather area. So you can sort of see visually that's the great thing about watercolor and gouache is you can kind of see how something is done. If you know what the different effects are, you can sort of look at something and deconstruct it yourself and say, okay, well, this effect was used here and another effect was used here. 
So I did this toucan study all in one day. According to the video footage, it was almost four hours. It was a fun piece to do because I just used ink tents like wash again. So basically I was using the ink tents more opaquely rather than transparently. And I think it works pretty well as a gouache or opaque watercolor. It looks better this way than it looks as a transparent watercolor. And despite the debates, the light fastness of Ink Tense as a brand, apart from a few colors, is pretty good. So it's still an artist grade product. There's no need to really, you know, demote it to the extent where you think it's a student grade product. But I just cover all my bases, literally, by just giving my Ink Tense pieces a top coat of Liquitex gloss medium, which has UV protection, and imbues it with even more longevity. Ink Tense and the Dr. Phil Martin Bombay inks are my two waterproof mediums that let me paint in an acrylic style, and my fine watercolors and gouache are my non-waterproof mediums, which I love more for various reasons, including that they're more vibrant, but they aren't waterproof. If you want to learn more about Ink Tense vis-a-vis -vis watercolor and gouache, I have a long video just on that, as well as video playlists for those separate medium demos. And I really like how that purple makes that great low-intensity aubergine shadow on that red. It's nice. It's not such a big deal to follow the bead if it's all a solid fill black, because black pretty much covers itself up and doesn't show the hard edges there. Yellow is another color like that. So the only thing really left now is the branch that he's perched on and also his feet. The feet I didn't end up filming. Some of my other videos where I do birds, like the Carolina parakeet, if you don't know how to do bird feet, then that'll be one way to figure it out. I did a pretty accurate job with uh, drafting, and after you have a solid start with that nice, strong, freehand sketch, then you can go ahead and do a good job with the painting, too, because, you know, I'm not trying to fix mistakes with the paint that I made with the pencil. I was happy with the textures that I achieved with uh, the ink tents in a gouache-like fashion. So with the branch, though, I put yellow ochre in a solid fill area. Then I came back in with the purple and some of the mud that I had in the palette that was mixing with the red and the purple and the black and everything. I had all these colors I'd been using before and just used those to create the brown shadow. This is a better idea than reaching for the pre-mixed brown in this set because it's just going to give me more harmony with the rest of those colors. I maybe could have even started with the yellow instead of using yellow ochre because there really isn't any yellow ochre in the rest of this piece. So to even increase the harmony further, I could have not used this yellow ochre and used the yellow instead as the base color. But really keep it as an accent color and try not to have more than six if you can because it will disrupt the harmony of your overall piece in the end. Well, wizards, I hope you enjoyed this Inktense demo master study and collab vid with David Gordon. Don't forget to check out his video and channel as well. And please like, comment, subscribe, and check out my website dashboard for all my online platform links on one page to support my art creation and instruction. Thanks for parking your brushes here and wishing you all inky art adventures.